This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome to this lecture on cascaded option trees. In this video I would like to explain how the method of cascaded option trees works and would like to apply it to an example case. The example case is actually the selection of an extractant for solvent extraction, actually reactive solvent extraction. Um, this method has been derived and has been proposed based on experiences that we had with a variety of industry cooperations with larger uh, groups that were working together with larger teams. And there we developed that method and it is shown that it works quite well, especially in such an environment. So the example should be the selection of an extractant. Now, how do you typically choose your extractant for a solvent extraction process? And this is shown in this um, overall scheme. Well, first of all, you define your design task which means you define your mass flows, the desired purities of the extract, as well as the raffinate. Either the other one is possibly given by mass balances, depends. So you first define your design task. What do you want to achieve? Then the next question is, is an extractant predetermined or suggests itself due to the overall process or boundary conditions? For example, in some cases you have uh, other processes in the vicinity, either, so to speak, in the vicinity with respect to the uh, processing steps or in the vicinity geographically in the neighboring uh, process, for example. So there some uh, extractants may be uh, suggesting themselves. On the other hand side, they may be also predetermined or there may be severe boundary conditions. For example, if you want to extract food ingredients or pharmaceuticals, in those cases, the available extractants are rather, rather the number of rather uh, is rather limited. So only a very small selection with respect to uh, safety issues and toxicity issues uh, are permissible for that case. So, if that is sort of predetermined or some uh, so extractants are suggested, then you can skip the next point. The next point is actually to look for possible options for the extractant based on literature evaluation regarding physical properties like for example polarities or use prediction method for estimating the equilibrium and possibly very first checking experiments, so equilibration experiments. One can discuss all these methods in, in more detail, for example uh, polarities, you have the dipole moment that you can sort your components with respect or possible extractants with respect to polarity, to with respect to the dipole moment. Um, as just one example, you can also use parameters, thermodynamic parameters that characterize that somehow. For example, you can uh, regard the Hildebrand uh, sortability parameter to, uh, for that, or you could use um, the octanol water partition coefficient, which is available experimentally for a quite large number of components, or on the other hand side, um, can also be obtained from prediction method with a certain accuracy for new uh, extractants. But actually in most cases you will rely on extractants that are known to a certain extent. Then uh, for prediction method, methods for estimating equilibria, you can again use different methods. For example, the UNIFAC method can be used as a group contribution method based on uh, activity coefficient models as a one option, or you can use uh, real prediction things from quantum mechanics like the COSMO uh, approach, COSMO RS or uh, COSMO therm, to predict the liquid-liquid equilibria. One should be uh, cautioning a little bit with respect to those prediction methods. Also, if you use predictions for calculating the uh, polarities, of course, like the octanol water uh, partition coefficient, one has to be a little bit careful with that. In many cases, the right order of the desired properties are uh, depicted by that method, but the individual values may have a certain error with respect to the uh, 
the equilibrium, the partition equilibrium of your desired component in the extraction process afterwards. So one always has to do some experiments and so you can also directly start with some experiments in some cases. If you have an idea of which um, suitable extractants are possible, you can directly use some equilibrium experiments for that. Sometimes it's easier and cheaper than doing all the um, mechanics, mechanics of the thermodynamic predictions and everything. Okay, in any case, you get a certain selection of potential extractants and then you have to investigate them with respect to different properties. And on the one hand side, these properties are those which are relevant for operating the process, which is densities, viscosities, interfacial tension and wetting behavior. Uh, densities, for example, you want to separate afterwards your extract and your raffinate, so there has to be a certain density difference. Viscosity should not be too high because the pumping energy should not should be appropriate and also the flow velocities, the sedimentation velocity should be fast enough so that the process is really operable. Uh, interfacial tension should be in some intermediate range. If it's too low then the system tends to form an emulsion, which is not desirable. On the other hand side, if the interfacial tension is too high, you need too much energy to produce sufficiently small drop to increase the mass transfer area. So interfacial tension should be, should be in some intermediate range. And the wetting behavior is of course important. If you want to use equipment with internals, then the internals should typically not be wetted by uh, the dispersed phase. So that defines more or less to a certain extent which of the phases is to be dispersed afterwards in the process. So that are the basic physical parameters. On the other hand side, then you need to know a little bit things that are more relevant really for the actual extraction. On the one hand side, with experiments, you want to have equilibrium distribution, so partition coefficients of your desired components, possibly also of undesired components if it's multi-component process. Then the settling time to characterize the coalescence behavior, because typically you disperse one of the phases in the other in order to increase the mass transfer area and after that of course you need to separate the phases again because afterwards in the following process steps you would like to have clear phases to work on. And that can be characterized by settling experiments. I will say something about it in just a minute. And then of course you need to estimate the typical drop size. Does the system in itself have a certain typical drop size that you realize occurs over and over again independent of energy input things like that? Or on the other hand side you can of course ask the question the other way around. How much energy do I need to produce the typical typically desired uh, drop size. For solvent extraction, typical drop sizes are somewhere of the order, well, experts say somewhere between 1.5 and 2.5 millimeters. Of course, it's always a drop size distribution, so you will have larger drops, you will have smaller drops, but that should be, so to speak, the maximum of that distribution, somewhere in that range between 1.5 and 2.5 millimeters in typical situations. Of course, there are always extremes possible under or for certain specific separations, but that's just a typical uh, value. After that, you have a first definition of your extraction conditions. Uh, you have to do that, your choice of the dispersed phase based on these data. The phase ratio can possibly already be estimated or designed to a certain extent. The number of theoretical stages can be designed based on the equilibrium information and that should actually for most of the extraction processes be preferably less than 10 to 15 somewhere. Even though one clearly has to say mm, there are uh, extraction processes operated under technical conditions, so really for technical processes which with many more uh, theoretical stages, 20, even 40 or even more, depending on the price for your final product and the um, flow rates and everything, so that can be significantly higher in some cases. These parameters that you determine depend of course on those things that have been determined previously. Uh, namely the equilibrium tells you something about how many theoretical stages you need, the uh, coalescence behavior together with interfacial tension and wetting behavior tells you something about which of the phases should be the dispersed phase uh, and it tells you also something, defines you somehow the phase ratio that you want to uh, operate uh, at. So these things result, so to speak, from these previous um, 
considerations. And now, of course, if you are lucky, you will find a system that works, which you then test under pilot plant scale or lab scale conditions uh, for the extraction with a small mixer settler cascade or with a small extraction column, depending on which type of equipment you are thinking about. If you don't have an option here, uh, if it doesn't work out, sometimes that is the case, then you of course have to go back and come up with more uh, uh, proposals for possible uh, extractants. Okay, now we want to apply this, but we want to apply this, so that's our background ground knowledge, so to speak. Now we want to apply this to the specific case of a, a downstream process in applying extraction. And the specific case is that we want to apply it to a biotechnological a production process. So we have a fermenter, a bioreactor, where our reactants are entering. Then we have a primary separation, where it is preferably in situ, so we are extracting directly from the fermentation broth. Why is that beneficial in many cases? Well, in many cases, if you have a fermentation, you have a so-called product, product inhibition. That is, the product is either toxic to the uh, microbes uh, on the one hand side, or on the other hand side, the more product you have, the more, of course, your equilibrium is shifted uh, to the other side. So the, the kinetics, the driving force is decreasing, and that decreases the productivity of your process. So for that, you would like to keep your product concentration low. And so you want to have a primary separation to get your product out of the fermentation broth, recycle the fermentation medium, and after that you can then take what you have removed from your fermentation broth and go through final purification processes, the full downstream process up to reaching your final product specification. So that is the idea we want to have a look at. And now we want to apply what we call the option tree method to that, and so I should first tell you how that works. It works such that we very systematically write down the different options that we have, and on the other hand, the criteria that we want to apply to um, decide if an option makes sense or not. And for finding out or to, to code somehow the results, or to speak how the different options perform with respect to the different criteria, we want to use a very intuitive color code. Uh, if it's white, it's not tested. If it is red, or you, if you don't have colors available in just black print, then uh, you can have a minus, which means it's infeasible. It simply does not work. Uh, yellow or zero means it is acceptable, so it may work, but it's not optimal. And if it's green or a plus, then it's a good performance. And now we want to fill, so to speak, for the different options, the in individual uh, boxes here, with respect to the different criteria. So how do the different criteria work for the different options that we have? And to the left, actually, we have the overall performance indicated. So if this, everything is green here, then this will be a green as well. If, every, if, if you have one red here, that is being red here. And if it's somewhere in between, yellow, green, then you have to decide, so to speak, is it more yellow or more green, depending on the importance of the different criteria. First of all, you will, of course, have the essential criteria. So those that, if they are not fulfilled, the process will not work. So these are the most critical criteria. And then possibly you can also look at further criteria down the road, so to speak, that would be nice to have and to see, for example, to select the different uh, extractant uh, options uh, in, in, to, to investigate that in more detail and discriminate that in more detail. Of course, if you think about the overall downstream process, there are many more options than just solvent extraction. And this I want to show here in, uh, in the first level of option trees, so to speak. Uh, and the first idea you can come up with is, well, you can use distillation, you can use solvent extraction, you can use reactive extraction and crystallization. I should possibly say something about that, especially about this distinction, solvent and reactive extraction. It's common in Europe, I guess, it's not so common in the United States or somewhere else in the world, because in many cases, if people talk about extraction, they actually mean reactive extraction. So there is a reactive agent in the organic phase that pulls the uh, desired component into the organic phase by a dedicated extraction, uh, dedicated reaction. And solvent extraction is just the distribution, the physical distribution, the nonce distribution, um, without any reactive step. 
In some cases you have mixed forms where actually reactions take place but you don't consider them in that detail. But anyway, in principle you have these different options. Crystallization can also be an option if your product concentration is high enough. And then there are of course certain criteria that you want to fulfill. It's a biocompatibility for example for really this in situ extraction. The thermal stability of the product has to be considered and is the product concentration you can achieve uh, sufficiently high so that you get an enrichment because typically in fermentation broth or fermentation processes the product concentration is quite low so you want to increase that by the first primary uh, separation step if it is possible. But you see already for distillation that will not be biocompatible because it's typically at too high uh, temperatures so that is red and that means at the directly you don't need to consider the further uh, the criteria because that means it doesn't work that's it. Then for solvent extraction reactive extraction both can be biocompatible it depends of course on the choice of extractant but there are biocompatible extractants available. Thermal stability because it's at low temp it's at ambient temperature or arbitrary temperature actually uh, that can be fulfilled as well so that the product if that is a little bit uh, unstable not so stable it can be ensured that that uh, is kept um, and then of course for the uh, production a uh, product concentration of course you increase the concentration significantly more if you use a reactive step because you can directly pull it dedicatedly in the into the uh, extractant phase and um, extract phase whereas for the solvent extraction you just rely on the physical equilibrium which may not be so perfect. Crystallization that depends a little bit you, on the details of course uh, it's also a concentration step the thermal stability because you have to typically cool the system down that can be critical at least for the uh, for the microbes at least they, they could die and the biocompatibility is also limited to a certain extent. So these things are not so optimal for a given case. As I said, this is just an example um, for that case. You can come up for a specific case with other evaluations. Of course, it always depends on the specific case. And now you can follow on with the next uh, level, so to speak. So this is the first option tree, if you like. And now you can branch that, so to speak. And that's actually why we call it cascaded option tree. Uh, and we take now this reactive extraction. Say, well, it's the, the most uh, promising uh, option that we have. And now we want to detail that further. And just as an example, you can use div different extractants. You can regard equilibrium, coalescence, and toxicity of the auxiliaries just as an example. Evaluate that is just an example, so to speak. But it shows you directly, again, which op of the options works, how well, and uh, then allows you to decide which extractant to continue with. Okay, so that gives you a first idea of such a cascaded option tree. Uh, now, of course, the question is, well, how do you evaluate these things? And that's a nice thing about the cascaded option trees method. It doesn't rely on a simulation method or experiments or whatever. You can mix your information uh, source. It can be exper expert knowledge. Knowledge. For example, if the biocompatibility, distillation, whatever, you don't perform experiments, you just know that's it. Then you can take literature information, you can also rely on modeling or simulation uh, or on the experiment. So for example, modeling can be thermodynamic modeling where you estimate the partition coefficients that then allow you to determine the equilibrium situation and that allows you to uh, evaluate the different options that you have. And of course, experiments are possible as well. The nice thing is again, it's not relying on some automated uh, modeling or whatever as some other methods do. It's just a mix. You can use whatever you like, whatever you prefer. At the same time, you can keep track, so to speak, in these option trees which method has been used. So in case, that's also one of the advantages, advantages as we will see later, uh, if the first option, that the, the best option, that was apparently the best option after a certain number of criteria had been evaluated, if that turns out that with the next criterion it is a complete fail, you can go for the second next option and you can then look, so to speak, at the certainty that which you have with respect to the different criteria depending on where that information was coming from, for example. So you may 
then redo experiments that are coming from uh, if you have, where you have taken the results from literature, you may do them yourself, and so on. So you have all the flexibility about the methods that you are applying to this option tree method. Okay, now we want to apply to the next level of refinement. And uh, again, I want to re rely on this example. It's a bioreactor, we know this already, but now it's worked out a little bit in more detail. Uh, possibly we have to use a filtration if it's not really an in situ uh, extraction so that we recycle the cells in that filtration step. We would like to avoid that actually. So the cells should be, or the, the extraction should possibly be biocompatible if that would be possible by any means. Then we have a first extraction step. It doesn't necessarily have to be in an extraction column, it can also be a mixer settler or whatever. Then of course we have a re-extraction step because you want to pull that back into the uh, organic phase and we saw uh, in the aqueous phase because we saw the uh, most promising step was reactive extraction so we use some reactive agent and we want to recycle that yeah that is actually the point so we want to have our uh, organic phase um, contact that with the, our aqueous phase for the re-extraction and then recycle uh, the regenerated reactive extractant into the primary extraction step and then recycle the fermentation medium as well and then with the aqueous phase that we obtain from the re-extraction we can do a final purification. Of course in principle the second step doesn't necessarily have to be a re-extraction even though it is in most cases is possibly the, 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 the first idea you may have but in principle of course this could also be a crystallization step or whatever where you re only re recycle or, or remove your um, product from your uh, reactive extraction by any means so that you can recycle the reactive extraction. Re-extraction is just one option for these different uh, steps that are possible in principle. Okay, now we can set up the, the options again for this specific case. So here we have again the liquid-liquid extraction and let's keep for the moment for this example the physical extraction or the reactive extraction where we can have now different extractants. It's taken from an industry corporation so the alternative extract may not be named but it's really taken from that. And we have then the extractant deeper which is of course uh, quite known in reactive extraction or an alternative extractant. And then we have different diluents in which you dilute your uh, or dissolve your reactive extraction, kerosene and some components from other component classes that are available. So these are typical uh, representatives of different possible diluent classes here as well as there. And of course you can use these diluents as physical extractant directly. So just two of them are mentioned here. And then we have our three criteria, toxicity, the extraction equilibrium and the ease of phase separation. And we see already here for the toxicity, the phthalates, they are not so good because of toxicity. So we would like to avoid them. Uh, and so they get a red box. So they are not uh, followed on any further. The next criterion is now the extraction equilibrium. And now we have to e evaluate the extraction equilibrium for the different cases. And we, I will just give you one example. This is shown here. It's a so-called degree of extraction as a function of pH, which is the typical diagram that you use if you have an ion exchange uh, mechanism in this case. Uh, this is actually the, the, the case. The component to be extracted is 1,6-diaminohexane. Uh, it is extracted from an aqueous phase with uh, DEPA in this case in uh, dissolved in kerosene. So the diluent for this example here is kerosene. Temperature is 30 degrees centigrade. Phase ratio for equilibrium is 1 to 1. You can choose it arbitrarily because it shouldn't depend on that. Uh, and then you can uh, evaluate the degree of extraction for different concentrations of the DEPA in the diluent. So between 2.5 and 100%. And you see apparently that the concentration shifts the um, position of this S-shaped transition function. The more or less, especially the point of inflection is moving, so to speak, depending on the weight percent of DEPA. What we see directly is independent of the weight per fraction of DEPA and the extractant, we are able at certain pH values 
to ensure that the desired component, this D-aminohexane, is extracted essentially completely. The degree of extraction is approaching 1. For other pH values, it is 0. So we can push it back, so to speak, into the aqueous phase. Which means that for the extraction, re-extraction, we can, for the extraction, be here, and for the re-extraction, be somewhere over here. So by a pH shift, we are able to extract and re-extract, which is, of course, nice. On the other hand side, we realize, well, there are certain boundary conditions because of the biocompatibility, which simply means that we would typically have like to have pH values to be biocompatible with the microbes somewhere between, it depends on the microbes. In this case, it was somewhere between 5.5 and 7 or something like that. So that is a typical range. Some microbes love it to be a little bit acidic, so they can go a little bit lower. But in this case, it was somewhere in this range. And you see that actually for all the concentrations of the DEPA and the diluent, you get nice results. It works quite well. At the same time, one can directly discuss thinking about re-extraction. Uh, that means, of course, if you have, for example, 100% deeper, then actually you have to shift your pH for the re-extraction down to essentially more or less zero or close to zero in order to do the re-extraction. And since the pH is a logarithmic scale, it means that you have to add lots of acid. And if you then want to recycle your uh, reactive extraction for your extraction step, you have to add a huge amount of your base. So overall, you're producing lots of salt. Uh, and of course, the more to the right that uh, curve is positioned, the lower will be your acid and base consumption for the uh, shift between uh, extraction and re-extraction. So for that, you would like to have actually a low concentration. On the other hand side, this means, of course, that the capacity is limited because it's the DEPA which is attack, uh, attaching to this di diaminohexane to pull it into the organic phase. So the lower the concentration, the lower is the capacity. So you have to find an optimum somehow. So as always in engineering, there, there are drawbacks of each option and you have to find an optimum. Typically, I should say, uh, the concentrations of the reactive extractants are somewhere between 5 and 20 percent in technical processes. So you would aim at, at this uh, region somehow. So there we see that for this example, and of course you have to do it for all, all the other options as well, for this example it works, you are able, you get good results. Extraction is easily possible, no problem. And so we can include that into our um, uh, option uh, uh, tree. And just the example that we looked at was kerosene, uh, with the DEPA, this is this green box, so to speak, that works very, very well. For the others, the equilibrium is slightly worse. It's not completely worse, but slightly worse. It would work in principle, but not as good as for the kerosene, for the alternative extractant. That is being evaluated as well. And for the physical extraction, the partition coefficient is so low that you can say that doesn't work on a technical scale. So that's red. That means also that this entire branch is now dead. You don't need to um, take that into account. You don't need to take physical extraction into account anymore. And also here you see that there's a second red one, so you can forget about that option as well. So these others are those are that are remaining. And the next step, of course, for designing is to evaluate the phase separation, the ease of phase separation. And you can do that in such an experiment. Should be a video. Uh, so you produce a dispersion one way or the other. Here it has been pre-produced and then filled into this uh, beaker which has a quantitative scale and then you evaluate, so to speak, how fast does this lower curve, which is the representing, so it's the height versus time, the sedimentation curve, up here the clear phase is being formed, so in this case actually the light phase is being the dispersed phase, and now you find here the coalescence curve. If you evaluate that, you also find uh, a limit here between the so-called closed pack dispersion, so here the drops are sitting on top of each other, they are sedimenting and then bumping into this closed pack zone. So below that you have the sedimentation zone and then after some time you only have these two clear phases, the coalesced previously dispersed phase and the continuous phase. And you can evaluate this settling time. And the settling time has to be in a reasonable range. Typically, it's uh, larger than, for technical systems, larger than 60 seconds, and it should be typically less than 300 seconds to allow an easy uh, 
uh, separation in a gravity settler. It also works if the settling time is longer, but then you need larger pieces of equipment and then economy may not be so uh, positive anymore. So you can evaluate that and evaluate that, of course, this settling time also as a function of the main parameters that you have. And one of the main parameters was the pH in that case. It's again uh, for that case, it's uh, kerosene now plus some the alternative reactive extractant in this case, which was also a more or less feasible option. And of course now the phase separation depends on the phase ratio. So you have to investigate different phase ratios between organic and aqueous phase and also different concentrations of the diamino hexane have been used. Again, everything takes place at 30 degrees. I don't want to go through all the details. The major insight is that the higher the pH, the longer is the settling time. So you would like to stay at lower pH values on the one hand side. And also what you see, well, I said the limit is somewhere around 300 seconds for the settling time. That can be fulfilled by more or less all phase ratios. It can be fulfilled for both of the concentrations of the product. So it's possible to operate that under these conditions at lower pH values. And these are still pH values which are feasible for the microbes, so that is still a biocompatible situation. So that would work in principle. Of course, if you evaluate that, if you do then an economic evaluation, you need to take these things into account in more, more detail. Also possibly the higher values and you have to evaluate, well, is the, the con lower consumption of chemicals that you have in, in that case, is that compensated or how does that compensate with the larger settle that you need and, and so you have to do the economic optimization after that. So now you can of course include uh, these results also in the option tree but before that actually uh, I mean this is the clean system again and now one has to take into account also that well there are microbes in the system at least they can be in the system the question is was before do I need to filter filter them out and clear, uh, treat only the clear phases or can I keep the microbes in my uh, fermentation broth during the extraction. And there one uh, thing can happen, it's a so-called crud formation. Now what is crud about? Well crud is, this is an example, it's an industrial system, so in this case the aqueous phase was a light phase, the organic phase was a heavy phase and in between you have a layer it's a stable layer of something that rests there. It's not a solid, yeah, if you stir it, it will move, but it behaves more or less like a creamy uh, uh, substance. And this is the so-called crud. Now different, uh, well, pe people have proposed different uh, reasons why that is called crud. Some say it's a chalk river undefined deposit where the chalk river plant was um, uh, plant to produce uh, nuclear fuels and there they uh, from from uranium ore and there apparently something like that occurred uh, more generally speaking you can also call it corrosion residual unidentified deposit this actually is a corrosion product so there is uh, iron oxide that you find as small solid particles in in that system in that in that crud layer and if that happens in such a well, flask, then it can also occur in your equipment and if it occurs in the equipment, so this is a gravity settler, and there you see actually that the dispersion band is filling more or less the entire settler. And actually in a continuous process that layer will build up until the entire settler is being flooded and then you can just stop the process because then you don't have any feasible phase separation anymore. And microbes act as solids so they can induce that uh, to a certain extent, actually quite strongly, and that is, <laughs> unfortunately, that's also pH dependent. So you have to evaluate the influence on the microbes on this phase separation also in this case. And I want to show how that really looks like, because actually what, what this actually constitutes is a so-called Pickering emulsion. That is a picture which has been taken uh, in a study by uh, well, that we did some time ago together with Sebastian Ruckes, uh, especially on crud. And this shows, so to speak, the small dispersion droplets that we have, which are in this case, it's an artificial crud that we produced, that are uh, surrounded by an, like an eggshell of the solid particles. 
it's an electron microphotograph and you see really the eggshell of the solid particles that surround the small droplets. And you see that now it's the eggshells which are interacting. Of course, they, this interaction hinders the coalescence of actually the drop phases. So there's a shell around the drop, so coalescence is being hindered. You have to evaluate that also if you are in the fermentation broth business, but also, of course, if you are in the mining industry, you have to take that into account. And in principle, for any other process, and I should say that that example before with this brownish layer in between, that was a technical application. It was not mining, it was not biotechnology, it was completely different. It was a corrosion product coming from some previous process steps, so it can always happen in any extraction process. Well, now we have to include that, those results also in our option tree, and there we see no green anymore. Phase separation is apparently the worst or the most critical criterion that we can evaluate. And that is generally so. It's a very general observation. Which means, of course, in principle, you would like to in analyze that first, because if you have so many reds, you don't need to consider these options any further. But actually that doesn't work, because only for after you know your ex extraction equilibrium, you know, for example, at which pH value you can do the proper extraction, and only then you can also investigate the phase separation in that uh, pH range of relevance. So it has to be done that, and unfortunately after that, only after that you can do the investigation on the ease of phase separation. And there you see that you have many reds and some are green. We don't need to continue that any further and the others that had a red before. And you, but you see that there are some options that are overall more or less feasible. The deeper with the kerosene would still be uh, an option. Possibly the equipment would be a little bit more expo uh, expensive. And then using the alternative extraction, in, in that case without diluent is the possibly most promising uh, process option. But you could also use kerosene as diluent or uh, this alcohol as a diluent. That would also be possible. Actually, this then later on has been chosen because this uh, react alternative extraction was most promising. So that has been the choice. It has been realized technically, but in principle you see directly with which other options you have, which are your second best options, so to speak. And that's also very nice about these cascaded option trees. Uh, well, now, you, uh, this shows only some criteria and apparently if you want to set up a process, there are many more criteria that you need to take into account. I just want to mention them to show you that you can really go through this diff these different criteria for all your options that you have step by step and you can do that based on experiments, experience or whatever. So for the extractant se selection you have well, is it biocompatible, your physical, extra your physical extraction system? What is the partition coefficient for the physical extraction? Uh, do you find biocompatible reactive extraction system, like a reactive extractant, diluent solvent, and possibly also a modifier that may be required? So is your overall reactive extraction system biocompatible? That one should say, um, Actually, that adding an organic phase to your fermentation broth or contacting with that, that with that is sometimes even beneficial because it has been reported in the literature that the, um, should I say, the cell membrane of the microbes is, so to speak, diluted a little bit because, of course, these organic components uh, partition into the cell membranes. That way, uh, pushing uh, apart a little bit the molecules, which then can lead to the case that actually a previously intracellular product is now being ex uh, removed from the cell or transferred more easily across the cell membrane so that you find it as an extracellular uh, component. So adding an organic component may even be beneficial for your fermentation process because you change from intercell intercellular a product to an extracellular product, which of course eases the overall process quite significantly. You don't need to destroy your cells anymore. They are still alive, they are still producing, but uh, they, uh, you don't need to kill them anymore and take them apart and then you actually typically wind up with a very ugly solution, which is difficult to treat. So if you add certain organic components, it may even be beneficial for the overall uh, process. Then you investigate the equilibrium without the cells. Well, typically one should say the equilibrium for the reactive extractant mostly depends on the reactive component, your actual reactive extractant, the diluent and the modifier often have only a minor influence. Also the cells only have a minor influence in most cases. Of course, all that influences 
activity coefficients and that shifts a little bit your equilibrium but the major direction of the equilibrium in many cases is more or less uh, quite uh, similar uh, uh, even sometimes identical. Then the extraction kinetics may be a, a point that you need to regard. In many cases if you have reactive extraction um, the extraction process is still fast enough only in some extreme case if you have very large molecules, if the system is very viscous. Then you need to take that into account. From our experience I can say for typical physical extraction, the extraction time required for typical drop diamines is somewhere between 30 to 60 seconds, then you are more or less at a zero concentration, no gradient anymore. Uh, for reactive extraction you find sometimes between two and three minutes, so it's a little longer but not excessively longer, so typically it works and you only in, then afterwards need to supply enough time, enough residence time in the mixing zone for example, or in the extraction column to make sure that um, the kinetics are coming to an end so that you get good separation. Then the ease of the phase separation, that uh, tells you of course if that is extraction is possible at all and also it's a main criterion for choosing between a column or a mixer settler or if it doesn't work at all. Columns only work if you have sufficiently or are preferred. If you have fast coalescence, fast se phase separation for the mixer settler you can allow also uh, slower phase separation because there you can increase the residence time within the settler almost arbitrarily. You can do that of course also in principle in the extraction column but typically you would like to have the coalescence within the column so sometimes the, the head of the column or the bottom is wider to give more interface for that coalescence process and you can also remove your two-phase system add it to a dedicated settler somewhere on the ground and then recycle your separated phases back into the column. But pr you would prefer typically to have your extraction uh, your, your coalescence occurring within the column. And that is so to speak limiting the uh, value of, of phase separation or settling time that is allowable to design a extraction column. Also of course with the cells, not only without but with the cells, uh, then thinking about the re-extraction can be re-extraction or some other, I should actually have, have written more, the recovery or recycle step for the reactive extraction. It can be a temperature shift which is typically preferred or a pH shift which is always producing lots of salt because you're adding base and, and, and an acid, so sulfuric so acid and uh, uh, sodium hydroxide and then you produce lots of sodium sulfate in the end in your waste streams, in your wastewater streams and you don't like that actually. Other options are of course possible crystallization sometimes or you can, uh, well sometimes you, the trick shifting the pH can be quite easy in some cases because uh, microbes sometimes need a certain amount of uh, ammonium components and you can use ammonia to shift your pH for the re-extraction and that way you are able to, so to speak, feed your bacteria with the ammonia directly. So there are options like that which are possible. Many things have been discussed in the literature about that. Then one has to consider also the fate of your starting materials, your reactants, of other components uh, that you need, the food for the microbes or salts that are available and also of the impurities. Where do they wind up in the process? Do they stay in your fermenter or are they uh, transferred into one of the product streams that you have in the end? So that way, that way you, you have to look at that. For example, in the extraction step you don't want to remove your reactants prefer, uh, stronger than your products. You put stick to the products mainly. Then there are many other things that are important, crud formation, choice of the nutrient system, the buffer system of the uh, fermentation and that is actually quite interesting point because it means that if you are involved in biotechnological process design, process development, you need to take these things into account directly at the beginning more or less because they influence the downstream process. So you should always include the downstream process considerations directly in the design of your uh, bio process, biotechnological process. Because if your biosystem is settled, you have optimized your microbes, your nutrient system, your buffer system and everything and then it turns out that the separation from that system doesn't work, you are lost. Often you can shift the, uh, especially the phase separation significantly by shifting the buffer system 
or the choice of the nutrient system because of the ionic composition of the components that you have in there that influences the phase separation quite significantly. Now this all relates more or less to the extractant selection. On the other hand side you can of course have a lot of further parameters and criteria that are relevant for the equipment design. And of course there you have many more options and you can of course treat those within the concept of the cascaded option trees as well. That would then be further down steps, so to speak, for the cascaded option trees. Now, after having discussed that, we can collect, so to speak, that and come up with a method how to apply the option tree method, this cascaded option tree method. As you have realized, possibly, we choose a starting level of detail. So where do we want to start to write down the different options? We note the feasible options, we note the relevant critical criteria, then we sort them by relevance, these criteria, but of course we have to take care, as I discussed before, some criteria can only be asked and evaluated after others have been evaluated. Then you evaluate the options and the criteria, preferably the most critical criteria first. And then, well, then there are different options. If there is at least one feasible option left, uh, you can ask yourself, do I need further refinement? No, then you found your solution. If there is no feasible option left after you ran through that process, then you can also say with a significant certainty, there is no solution possible. Now, this is also quite important outlet of this overall process. If you have run through that process quite several times and no solution is found, then you are lost. If you need refinement, then you can, of course, uh, rank the available options and step to the next level of detail and do the same thing again. What is missing here a little bit is also uh, well, a practical recycle or a practical loop because this assumes that you write down all feasible options and all relevant criteria. Of course, typically in reality, in real life, you wouldn't do that. You would start out with the most promising options that you think are most promising and with the most important criteria first. See if it works and if you then wind up at this position, yeah, that you say no solution possible, then of course you have to go back and think about second best options and so on. So this loop is left out because, well, here it has been written all feasible options in principle. Typically, you do it more practically with the most promising ones. Further levels you may uh, look at are uh, the optimal overall process options, the principal downstream options, so this is very generic. Then which unit operations can be used for the specific pur purposes, crystallization, whatever. Uh, which, which extractant or other auxiliary components should be selected. Then the direction of dispersion can be, opti or can be selected based on such option trees. Uh, which are the optimal, optimal operating conditions like pH, phase ratio and so on. So also these things can be regarded as options that you have that you then evaluate with respect to certain criteria where at a certain level of course econ economy is coming into play. Um, then which type of equipment is uh, uh, optimal for the process and so on with respect to these things. And then also you can apply that. We did that also in a very um, very different applications actually. We ask ourselves which modeling approaches and model contributions if you have uh, combinations of individual models to give an overall simulation tool, which individual model contributions are feasible. So we can apply this method of cascaded option trees not just to equipment and downstream processes, but to completely different questions that you want to answer. As long as you have different options and you have criteria that you can select, then uh, you, have, uh, you can set up the corresponding option trees. Now, what are the advantages? After that, it goes a little bit back to um, those things that we have experience in applying that in industry corporations. The most important thing is it's a very clear bookkeeping of the available options and the criteria that you have considered. And that's a big uh, advantage. It's also a very good basis for documentation. So in each uh, report, you can show your current status of your option tree. You add more options, you add more criteria, and one directly sees what you have been doing. And also one sees directly why things work or why things don't work. Um, you cascade through the levels 
the different, le questions, uh, different levels of questions you can ask with a consistent methodology. You structure your own investigations, especially trying to, ask, uh, to answer the uh, most critical criteria first. Uh, that allows you to directly rule out at the beginning the, uh, the worst options. Um, it allows different means of evaluation. That's quite positive because you can mix expert knowledge, literature and whatever. Uh, also, the reasons for ruling out certain options is not forgotten. It's also important in some cases, especially if your most uh, promising options or those that you thought were more pro most promising don't work out. You can look back, what have I done? Where possibly need I to improve the result? Where is a certain uncertainty in a certain result? So you can look through these things, these things as well. It's a clear view of the second best alternatives. If your best alternative uh, fails further down the road with some criteria, Uncertainty can in principle be included. I mentioned that already when discussing the different uh, reasons for the dismissal, for example. You know very clearly the status of a project. It supports especially the communication with other groups, other teams or other partners. That, was, that we found actually quite important because everybody else always knew exactly what we had been doing and what the status was and why it was such. And of course, and sometimes if you, for example, in this considering well rethink your nutrient con con uh, composition, rethink your buffer system. If you tell that to the biotechnologists, they will say, oh no, everything is settled. But if you can show them it doesn't work, we have tried everything and it doesn't work, but if you would shift that a little bit, then things work better. It's an ionic composition, you can explain that for the phase separation in this specific case. Then you have some arguments that possibly they rethink their previous choices. Also, you can create prototypes of procedures. What I've shown you for the extract and selection, you can go through the same criteria and the similar options over and over again. You only need slight adapt adaptions, but overall the process can be identical. So you create prototypes of procedures. And I find it, or we find it actually quite intuitive to use. And as I mentioned already, you can also apply it to other problems, the model development, or if you have cause-effect analysis for some problems that occur in a certain situation, then you can also use that uh, to evaluate your different options that are explanation for such uh, possible cause-effect things that occur. Finally, I should mention uh, the major references for this cascaded option trees. Of course, in between I have used other knowledge, so to speak, for example, the CRUD formation I've used from Sebastian Ruckes, uh, which you also find on my homepage, the, 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 the publications of that. That's actually a report mainly. And these are those things on the cascaded option trees, then the uh, solvent extraction for bio-based components, and uh, the reactive and physical extraction for bio-based diamines from fermentation media. So these are really the, uh, the publications from which this context mostly has been taken. Okay, that's that. With that I would like to finish actually with the take-home message. Cascaded option trees are an easy and well-structured way to organize the multitude of options during process development on different levels of refinement. With that I would like to say thank you. I hope that I could advertise that method uh, to you to a certain extent so that you possibly think in these terms at least in your future work and that it actually helps you in your work. Thank you very much and I hope to see you again in the next video.